So welcome everyone uh, to this peer support call today. Uh, the wonderful Max Ponticelli, general manager at Wilbury Theater Group and lecturer in theater at UDRI, going to be our uh, main speaker and facilitator today. Um, live streaming performances and concerts. So these calls are intended to be more conversations. Max is going to give some information sharing as well as a way to have a a platform for that and actually if you all wouldn't mind uh muting yourselves if you could just because there's some background noise and then you can unmute yourselves if you have to ask questions etc um so these peer support calls are something we're doing amid the COVID 19 uh pandemic and all the fun associated with that as a way to stay connected um from the first ones we did in our first week there was a desire to have some that were more topic focused particularly on topics related to having negotiate various challenges in the environment we're in now. Um, we're gonna keep on doing these about two to three times a week, it looks like, and I'll schedule them based on what people are interested in probably around Thursday or so, so today for the upcoming week. Um, if you're interested in facilitating a conversation on a call, please let me know. You can let me know in a survey that you'll receive that you'll respond to. Uh, if you're interested in seeing calls on certain topics, you can also kind of let me know that in that survey as well. This actually came out of uh, a survey response and Max volunteered to facilitate a conversation from that survey response. Just to plug ones that are coming up, from noon to 1 p.m. tomorrow, uh, the development staff at Community Music Works is going to be facilitating a conversation around fundraising in the midst of the COVID-19 epidemic. Um, they're also doing it in wonderful partnership with uh, AS220 and Trinity Rep as well. They're all kind of contributing ideas to the conversations. And I can imagine that this will be multiple kind of conversations that will happen uh, through Zoom over time about how one fundraises in this moment in different aspects, individual artists, I'm sorry, individual donors, uh, corporations, foundations, etc. cetera. Uh, next Wednesday from 10 to 11 a.m., there's going to be more of an open-ended call that'll be education and arts and education programming focused. Maggie Anderson, our director of education, will be there and she's going to answer questions people might have and provide whatever hot intel she has from the from RIDE and from national partners because everyone obviously, as you all know, is trying to figure out hour to hour, moment to moment what's happening. Uh, I think that is it. Max is going to go over the format with you all. So, Max, go ahead and take it away. All right. Thank you, Todd. And hi, everyone. Good morning. I hope everyone's um, doing all right in this uh, weird time that we find ourselves in. Um, so, yeah, a little bit about the format today. I have um, a couple pages of notes um, that I'm just going to go through. Forgive me. Like Todd mentioned, I'm a lecturer in the URI theater department. Um, so I do have my lecture planned. Um, I'm going to try not to take up a lot of your time with that. Just get through the notes, get through the stuff I have to get to. Um, a lot of this might be repeat information for some of you. Um, I know there are some people probably on this call who are not as familiar with technology and the terms that are flying around in the streaming world. So if some of this stuff is a repeat for you, just bear with me. Um, and who knows, maybe you'll learn what an acronym stands for or something. Um, but we're just going to go over the basic terms and kind of the general gist of what streaming is and how it works and the processes behind it. Um, so, yeah, like Todd mentioned, I'm the general manager at Wilbury Theatre Group. And um, how this all this whole streaming thing came about... Um, Josh Short, who's our artistic director um, and the founder of Wilbur, he's on this call too. Uh, he, we were in the middle, I'm uh, not in the middle, we had just started our run of Miss You Like Hell, um, which was this awesome musical about the immigration crisis um, written by some local playwrights. And we, we just opened the play and then the next week the governor shut down the state um, and revoked performance license, performance licenses. Um, and that was a huge disappointment we were we were very sad um the play was a, a beautiful play with an awesome cast and a really great message um and so we were, josh and i were thinking to ourselves like how do we get this out how do we get this to people is there a way to record this is there a way to stream this um and we started exploring the technologies and started purchasing a couple pieces of equipment you know before um before shipping kind of decreased and ever the only thing everyone was worried about uh shipping was hand sanitizer um 
So we were able to get a GoPro um, video camera, um, a couple mics, some cables, all of that kind of wonderful stuff, and, and put together what you're seeing now on our site. Um, and let me just also say like right up front from a uh, kind of concept standpoint, when we talk about streaming the arts and streaming theater in particular, like we do, um, and a little bit of music too, we all know it's not the same. Like we know it's not as good. We know it's not ideal. And I think our patrons understand that as well. Um, it's not going to be equal as it would be if we were all breathing the same creative air. But what we're seeing right now is an increase overall in percentages of streaming services across the United States and world because everyone's shut inside. And as long as we're able to connect with our patrons and our supporters, we think that's the important thing. And if embracing technology, which typically isn't, you know, <laughs> uh, standard in the theater, um, because we think, you know, talking person to person, I think conceptually, um, is just a better art form. Uh, if it means you have to embrace streaming technology, um, like we've been kind of pushing against in recent years, then I just say do it. Um, it's a way to talk to your people. It's a way to keep connected. And that's why we do theater is to connect with people. Um, so how do we do that? How do we stream? Um, we use the interwebs, right? It's just a series of tubes. Um, it's And what we're seeing in the internet um, in recent decades is the democratization of things, the dem democratization of music, with streaming music, and if everyone is uh, remembers Kazam um, and the wonderful downloading peer-to-peer -peer softwares that we could do, um, GarageBand being able to edit your own music, YouTube, the democratization of movie stars and fame and all of that kind of wonderful stuff. Um, this is your toolbox. This is your playground now. Um, so if you're not familiar with the internet, I would recommend play around. Um, you got all the time in the world now, so um, explore a little bit. Um, so I'm assuming right now the majority of people in the chat have had a Zoom meeting or a WebEx meeting or a Google Hangouts meeting or a Microsoft Spaces meeting or something like that. Um, I think it was Teams meeting or a big blue button. Um, and we've definitely had to get used to that. We've had to uh, figure out which place in our house has the best lighting. We have to figure out which, uh, what's the quietest room, uh, which door can I shut so that animal doesn't, the cat doesn't start walking across your camera and interrupt the middle of a meeting, right? Um, I think yesterday we had a staff meeting at URI and someone's kid ran in and just surprised someone and just they jumped a mile and it distracted us for like five minutes, right? Um, we're all getting a, a behind the scenes view of all of our coworkers now that we never thought we would have. Um, but that's kind of, we have to kind of embrace that. Um, so do exactly that. Explore your house, figure out which background is the best, figure out where, where the windows are in your house. Um, what are the places that you can shut away and kind of have a private space? Um, because lighting and sound matters. Uh, not only for the folks who in here are live performance um, experts or veterans. Um, don't, you do a, a couple quick tips. You don't want to have a window behind you. Um, if you have a bright light source coming behind, you can kind of see my arm fading out right now. Um, the, the camera on your screen is going to try to focus on the brighter light source and not necessarily your face. Um, I know I've had a couple meetings where you can't actually see the person who's talking because all you're looking at is the wonderful trees behind them outside their house. So don't have a window behind you. Um, try to put a light, and right now I have two lights on. I have a light over here. You can kind of see the shadow of it. I have a light right here in front of my computer, and I have the natural light from the window coming in over here. So it's sort of balanced. Um, you want to pay attention to that. Um, what you see on your screen is what everyone else is seeing too. You have no excuse not to ch check it. Um, use headphones. Um, not only because it'll help you hear people better, but it also cuts down on the echo. When you have to hear the sound coming out of your computer, it, that your computer microphone also picks that up. So you're creating distortion just inherently. So even if it's just a simple pair of headphones, like I'm using my iPhone headphones just plugged into the port on my computer, 
I think they work really well. You don't need a fancy microphone setup. I personally have a Yeti mic right under here, underneath my computer, that picks up my sound really well. Um, I usually check that daily, um, like by opening up a sound program and just checking my balance. Um, and if we were streaming something um, that was, you know, consumable by the public, we would of course do that. In the same way in a live performance, we would do a level check, uh, both lighting and sound, make sure everything works. Um, you're going to want to do the same thing with streaming. So you're going to start to see some of the similarities between live and between recorded stuff. Um, there's no need to scream. You can assume people can hear you. Microphones are pretty sensitive nowadays. Um, again, that's another reason to check your levels. Um, and check your background too. Um, yours... There's oftentimes stuff in the back. Right now I have like a little thank you Riska thing set up here. Um, you can do things like that. And right now you're just seeing our home office. So all of our books are behind us, um, a couple of motif awards randomly, um, and some little figurines from our drafting class um, at URI. So check your backgrounds. Um, there's also uh, the ability in Zoom. Right now we're using Zoom, right? Um, there's the ability to use fun backgrounds. Um, so I would say use these um, with a certain discretion, right? Um, it, is, it is fun to throw up a virtual background like this and have everyone get a good chuckle at first, but these things start to get tired really quickly. Um, I also try to find blank backgrounds. Um, I used this one the other night, just a blank black background for our um, streaming performance of um, Darcy Denigan's play um, Chernobyl Babies. Um, and this was a great way to kind of conceal anything behind me. Right now you can sort of see my hands are getting distorted, but still it's clean and you can't argue with that. Um, and then of course too, if you want to be in a nice grassy setting or an outer space, you can also do that too. Um, if you're a teacher like me, um, your students are going to want to do this a lot. Um, there's not much you can do about it, um, other than like forcibly muting their video. Um, but that has to do with like security stuff. And as our friend Daniel from Bring Your Own Improv um, mentioned before our meeting started, um, we'll talk a little bit about those features um, a little later in here. So explore the program. That's kind of gets to what I'm, I'm talking about. You have, you have the ability of, to use Zoom on your own. You don't need to be a part of a meeting. You can just start your own meeting um, and explore the different features, see what things do. You, again, we all have a lot of free time in our hands, so explore these things. Um, for us at URI, we're in week two of online teaching, so everyone's kind of expected to know every feature of it. Even if we don't, even if we're not familiar with it, um, we're kind of expected, especially by the youth um, that we're teaching, that we should know what we're doing at this point. Um, we, Todd mentioned this um, right at the top of the meeting, um, use your mute button. So one of the features of Zoom and other online streaming platforms is it has to focus on one particular person, right? So uh, sometimes when multiple people are talking, you're going to hear the sound cut out. And this happens even if, you know, someone picks up and drops something or like takes something out and accidentally touches the microphone on a different screen. All of a sudden your vocal feed starts to cut out and then start like this, and that's not good. Um, so definitely, um, if you're not speaking, be respectful and mute your mic. Um, it helps everyone else to get a clear voice out there. Um, same thing with your video. Um, you, if you're going to be folding laundry in the middle of your meeting, just mute your video. Because like, however much we all know we have stuff to do at home and we all are working from home, um, we all don't need to see what kind of underwear you have. Uh, so now that we kind of understand the basics of Zoom, and I'm assuming most of the people in here because you've been on a Zoom call before have, are understanding these types of things, um, I have a couple terms that you're probably going to hear when we're streaming. So here comes the vocab. I'm sorry in advance. Um, latency. Latency is the delay in the transfer of data. Okay, so everything that we're doing flies through the internet via electricity. It goes at the speed of light, which is almost 300 million meters per second. Now, that's wicked fast, right? But we also have to understand that it is still a speed, and the farther distance we are going, there will be a delay. Subsequently, 
if you're streaming something to someone else who then is streaming that thing to someone else, you're doubling the delay. Um, so keep that in mind. There will always be an inherent latency if we are streaming and nothing will ever be as quick as, as it is live. Um, as quick as it would be for the sound waves to enter your brain and that to be transferred to thought. That goes faster than the internet um, for now, right? Um, and also uh, to keep that in mind that all, the, all of those latencies, all of those processing speeds are based on what your computer can do. Um, we ran into a little bit of issue with this and same thing in my classes. If you're using um, like a, a Chromebook, which is built for compact travel, not necessarily processing speed, um, Chromebooks can have a bit of a delay and they can have a lack in quality. So definitely pay attention to how much RAM you're using, what the memory is on your computer. If it's an older computer, you're going to start to probably see those delays, that, that, that kind of the, the choppy video and the choppy sound. Pay attention to that. Um, you're going to want to close all other programs. So if you are streaming something, make sure the streaming thing is the focus of your computer. Um, don't have 14 tabs open um, and checking on your YouTube and Facebook feed. Um, try If you're in your household, make sure that like, the kids aren't downloading music or someone's not trying to stream a huge movie on Netflix and also talk on their FaceTime with their friends at the same time. That, that just starts to overwhelm your at-home network. So, so keep that stuff in mind. Um, we're going to get to how to test that stuff a little in just a second. So one thing that we're doing at Wilbury that kind of cuts down on that latency is something called um, simulcasting. So we don't have to stream through three different platforms. We're right now, currently, we're streaming on Vimeo, YouTube, and Facebook all at the same time. We're able to do, and Zoom, so four things actually. So what we, what we did last night um, for our Roadhouse the Musical, and I'll show you that in a minute, um, is we, were, we had a Zoom meeting, and one of the features of a Zoom Pro account, um, which costs about like $15 a month, I think, um, is you can simulcast, um, or you can stream out to a service. So what we're able to do is stream our Zoom meeting, the thing that we're doing right now, to our Vimeo page, which then simulcasts it out to both YouTube and Facebook. Um, right now, we, we were trying to, um, also stream it out to LinkedIn, but we were running into a little pro, uh, a couple problems with LinkedIn. They, they tend to be very uh, stringent on their uh, permissions as far as like streaming media goes. Um, so we're working on that too, but hopefully we would have five um, at that point. Um, so that's what simulcasting is. Essentially it's live streaming at the same time on multiple platforms. Um, you're going to see terms like audio only. Um, that's exactly what it sounds like. You're streaming just audio. You, there's no video. Um, you might run into the term VoIP um, or voice over internet providers. Um, that's a way to essentially make a call over the internet. Um, I would advise maybe if you're running a Zoom meeting and you also want to VoIP something in, avoid that because again like we talked about earlier you're going to start to be overwhelming your at-home network so um if you're doing something on the internet try to focus on that thing um don't overload the network maybe use the cell network on your phone turn off the wi-fi on your phone and use your data on your cell phone um and share screens options i'm gonna do uh this is a fun thing to do in zoom um that i'm gonna get to a little later when we show examples but sharing screens and sharing media is a wonderful way to kind of um improve or you know insert a random joke into your um into your meeting so for instance i could share my computer sound right now um, and everyone probably sees a little thing that pops up in the top of their Zoom meeting, right? Um, and I'm able to play music now um, for everyone. Which is a very appropriate song right now um, for the times we live in. Um, I also have a couple other queued up. You can't touch this. And of course... So feel free to use those features to improve your Zoom meetings. Um, I, I'm sorry, I just couldn't help myself. 
Uh, so we'll go. Uh, we'll do a little screen sharing later, and I'll show you some examples of other um, things that are being streamed right now. So I mentioned a little bit about stressing your home network. There's a website called speedtest.net, um, and I'm going to type this into the chat right now. If um, after our meeting is done, you can go to this website and you can test what your upload and download speeds are on your at-home network. So to give you an idea, um, and you're going to see these ratings in what's called bit rates, which is the amount of information that you can transfer at once. Everyone's heard of megabits and gigabits, um, all of that kind of all of that kind of stuff, particularly when we're talking about like our phone capacity, how many pictures we can um, capture and hold and all of that kind of wonderful stuff. Um, so for instance, before our meeting started, um, my download rate at home was 38.66 megabytes per second, and my upload rate was 24.61 megabytes per second. What that means is I'm able to download faster than I am upload. Um, when you're uploading something, essentially doing what we're doing now, we have a meeting and we are sending it out into the internet. You want to make sure that if you're streaming something, that that rate of transfer for your meeting is about half of the speed at which you just measured. So, for instance, if I'm going to stream an HD video, that's going to be somewhere in the neighborhood of three to five megabytes per second. So. If I go to speedtest.net and I see that my upload speed is somewhere in the neighborhood of like 10 or 11, I know I'm starting to get into like the danger Will Robinson zone of my video is going to be choppy, my sound night might not be good. Same thing with download. If you're downloading a bunch of information and um, processing stuff on your computer through the internet, if you start to get about halfway of your rate, that, that's kind of the danger point and your the system's going to start to get stressed after that. You only want to hit about halfway um, specifically because that leaves room for variances in the in the stream, in the in the feed. If anyone knows a professional electrician, that's the same thing they do in houses when they're um, trying to figure out how many amps your house needs. You never actually, if you have a 100 amp breaker on your house, you never actually want to run 100 amps in your house um, because then that could really stress or cause the system to arc or something like that, um, cause a fire. Could try to think about the internet in that same terms. Um, you're not going to catch your router on fire, but it will certainly slow it down quite a bit. Um, so try to remember those general rules. Um, again, the more stuff, the slower. Um, Zoom, uh, we talked a little bit about this already, it allows us to Zoom directly from the meeting. Now there's going to be a couple things that you need in order to do that. You're going to need um, three pieces of information. You're, uh, so if you're streaming on Vimeo or YouTube or Facebook, you're going to find uh, these three links. One is called the live stream link. This is the website that you use to look at the stream. Um, they usually look like regular websites, https um, colon slash slash vimeo.com slash thing. Um, and that's what you would send out to your folks to watch the thing. Um, Meg, I see your question. I will get to that in just a second. Um, your uh, RTMP, which is the real-time messaging protocol. This is another, it sort of looks like a website, um, sort of looks like a URL, except it usually starts with RTMP colon slash slash RTMP dot something something cloud blah blah blah. It's, what this is is the address of the server that you're going to in the cloud that is kind of streaming out the thing. Um, think of it like an address away from you. It's a server, in other words. Um, and then the stream key, which is the alphanumeric password. This is the key, this password you want to protect. Um, if you give out this password, anyone can stream to your service. Anyone can stream to that particular live feed. Um, so keep that private. That's very, very, very important. Um, so Meg, is there a way to measure the bitrate of the streaming that you are doing? So the way I measured the three to five was by going to YouTube and essentially streaming a, uh, uh, um, essentially viewing at the, there's a, there's a way that if you right click a YouTube video, it brings up something, uh, I believe the, it says like for the nerds and you can view 
exactly what the what the um, speed of that video is and how much processing speed it's taking up. Now that doesn't help you speed it, um, doing it out, but for from a general sense, an HD video streaming out. So like right now, I'm probably this is probably like a five because I also have. Um, this is streaming in HD, and there's also something in Zoom called touch-up, so to make my face look less splotchy. Um, so I'm probably streaming out at about 5 megabytes per second. That's, that's kind of a general, um, a general best guess. And that's sound, um, that's video, um, connectivity, all of that. Um, that, and that's, there's, if there's a, if there's a kind of a, a precise way to, to measure it, I don't know. But I'm going to write down, and I'm going to do some info research and get back to you. Um, so those codes that I mentioned before, the live stream link, the connecting RTMP or real-time messaging protocol, and the stream key are really, really important. Um, you're also going to view the term embed, E-M-B-E-D, or uh, maybe embed code. This is going to look like a lot of... Um, internet jargon when you see this code. It's essentially what you would give your website developer if they wanted to put that player on your website. These can be really useful. So if you don't want to have to tweet out um, links for different um, for different streaming sites for people to find you, you can always embed the video directly on your website. So people don't have to go searching for it all the time. They can just go to the typical website that they're used to going to to see your stuff and then view the player right there. Um, these can be really powerful. This is what we use with Go Local Prov um, because they were nice enough to partner with us. Um, they embed our YouTube page directly on their home page. So you can write around like six or seven o'clock when we have uh, something streaming, you can go to their website and view the link and view the, the feed that way directly through their website. So this is a wonderful thing to use if you have partners, if you have advertising and marketing partners. Look at, look at how you can kind of abuse the embed code. Um, now, we've only talked right now about streaming directly from the Zoom meeting or from your camera. Um, what you're going to need if you want to do something, say, with a bunch of multiple cameras, a bunch of audio feeds, you need, um, a, you need some type of a mixing platform. What we use at Wilbury is, some, is a program called OBS. And it's, um, you're going to, if you Google OBS Studio, um, it's a cross-platform multimedia mixing open source software that you can use to mix video feeds, multimedia and sound into one broadcast. It's like what you would see someone in a TV studio switching between um, to create different cameras and different feeds to send out. Um, you can monitor everything at the same time, but then fade in between different items. Um, it's free. It's, it tends to be a little bit more technical. So, um, and also because we're not doing as much in-person stuff anymore, um, you know, for safety reasons, um, we are kind of not using that as much. But uh, if everyone went to Wilbury's YouTube or Facebook page, um, we did a performance with Christopher Johnson, um, our first streaming performance, the one we, we kind of initiated this whole thing with. Um, and we used that program to film him in our space. This was before all of the limits on person, um, person to person contact came out. Um, and we were streaming in multiple microphones um, to get a better sound quality. So we had lavalier mics that were fed into a mixer and then fed into the computer. Um, and then we used OBS to take that and mix it with the video feed. Um, so it sounded better than the actual camera on the video or through the computer. Um, that was one of the ways we did that. Um, we were also able to create like posters um, to kind of fade between at the beginning and end of the program. Um, so I would look into OBS. Um, it's free to use. Um, it doesn't cost anything. Uh, it is a little bit more technical. So um, if, again, streaming and computers and technology doesn't tend to be your strong suit, but you still want to kind of play around with this, this is an excellent tool to use to bring multiple multiple options together. Um, so um, 
Oh, and before we get too far, we also talked a little bit about, before our meeting started, about um, what's called Zoom bombing. Um, so this is when, maybe in a classroom setting, um, you have a student or um, some type of foreign actor who's joining your Zoom meeting, who finds the link and then just like shows up and is like, ha, and throws something up on their screen that's really, really inappropriate. There are a number of options in Zoom to limit people's interactivity. You can um, mute everyone and take away their per permission to unmute themselves. So essentially, uh, you can decide when they speak. You can do the same thing with video too. Um, you can decide when or when not they can unmute their camera. Um, and we were talking, again, we were talking a little bit about this before. If everyone um, looks at the participants tab, so down at the bottom of your Zoom screen, you're going to see um, a, a little button called participants. If you click that, you can look through the list of everyone who's in this meeting right now. So Suzanne, Sarah, Ricardo, Nick, etc. Meg, hey Meg. Um, so, and there's also a button underneath that participants window that says raise hand and if everyone clicks that what Todd, what you're going to see is a little blue button or a little blue hand pop up next to your name and Todd essentially can call on you and say hey um, oh I see you have a question so instead of people going like this and being like hey excuse me I have I have a I have a question they can digitally raise their hand too and then once your question is answered you can lower the hand or Todd can lower it for you um, it's a nice way in a gigantic classroom setting to kind of control the crowd. Um, and I know Daniel at Bring Your Own Improv is also talking about audience involvement too. This is a great way to kind of control who volunteers for what and whether or not you think it might be a good idea that they actually get involved. Um, so sharing permissions, um, same thing. I'm going to share my screen in a second and show you some of the examples um, that I've been working with. Um, same thing with host permission. You can also give someone the permission to be a co-host with you. Um, or host a meeting in your absence. Um, these are really powerful tools that you can use um, to kind of uh, incorporate other people into leading these meetings. So right now what I'm going to do is share my screen. Um, what uh, I'm also going to share my computer sound. Um, so what you are going to see now is my screen. And I have a bunch of notes over here that everyone sees and you just saw a uh you now see a little picture of our wonderful friend andy russ um, because this is our website so this is what we've been doing at wilbury to let people know what's going on just like we would a normal season we have a calendar of events and links directly to our facebook and youtube pages right here so this friday we have one coming up with andy russ and so right now actually we have people with the ability to annotate your screens right so again, this is one of the permission things um, that we could do. So um, we have uh, something else coming up on Sunday, which is Luna Lobo by Shea Rivera, um, wonderful local artist, and then acting classes. And then we also have past things that we've done too. We mentioned Chernobyl babies earlier, all of that kind of wonderful stuff. Um, so this is where we're able to let our audience know what's going on. Um, on our YouTube page, this was um, the view last night when we started um, the Roadhouse musical. So I'm going to play this for you right now, and you're going to hear me go uh, do a funny little noise right at the beginning. Strip. Here we go. Yeah. Okay. So if anyone remembers yeah. the <laughs> So I'm standing through stripping my uh, alto saxophone. Is that what? what's going on here? And this Shannon. is what our Zoom meeting looked like. Um, it was a little bit chaotic, but as we went on, more people dropped out. We had a little bit to do in the beginning. Um, and what we were able to do um, is when someone mutes their video in Zoom, the live feed cuts out on them. So right now, we, even though we had more than six people or six screens in our shared performance. Um, Get in a barns. I woke up in a barn this morning because I got so drunk last night. Only those six people were able to perform. And then as I kind of scroll this through, you're going to see the amount of people go down to three and it went back up to four, et cetera, et cetera. This is one of the wonderful things um, when you mute videos that live streaming can do. Now, these live streams are also um, saved in perpetuity by YouTube and Facebook. So right now you're seeing the Facebook page. Um, we can view all of this stuff there. And as well as we can see 
all of the comments um, and kind of track the performance as it's happening. Um, what we've used this before to track any issues. So if there were like, if someone wasn't getting a clear feed or someone was muted or something like that, generally people are kind enough to um, say so in the comments and say so uh, in a calm and respectful manner. Um, so a couple of other examples that are going on right now. Um, Trinity Rep is doing some of this too. You're seeing a lot of um, rebroadcasting of previous stuff um, and kind of blog posts too. Um, so Trinity Rep is doing a little bit about this. I know the GAM the other day did a wonderful example, um, a wonderful lesson with Tony Estrella. Um, if anyone's ever taken a, a Shakespeare class with Tony, um, you'll know how awesome of it, it is. If anyone hasn't, I would highly recommend it. Um, wonderful, wonderful time. Um, and AS220 the other day live streamed something out, uh, something out from the third floor. They had some musicians playing. I think it was on their Instagram page in case you want to see it. Um, some other things that are going around the country and around the world. Um, the public theater um, is doing a lot of um, streaming performances, uh, a lot of rebroadcasts. Um, same thing with the National Theater over in the UK. Um, we have one, one man, two governors. Um, and these uh, you can watch directly on YouTube. And as you can see, 7 p.m. UK time, just the normal time you would see uh, a normal show. Um, the Globe is doing th similar things throughout the month. Um, we have a lot of Shakespeare's, um, which gets to points about um, rights and, per and performance, um, the ability to, to, to actually perform anything, um, as well as this wonderful theater, and I'm going to butcher the name, I'm sorry, I don't speak German, but the uh, Schaubun in Germany. Uh, it was ranked as like one of the coolest theaters in the world, apparently, um, and they're doing a lot of wonderful things um, as well. Um, and this is an example uh, from the Goodman Theater um, of one of their previous performances that they're showing, so I'm going to play this right now. The first time Jean-Claude Pelletier read Benovar Arcamboldi was Chris. And so as you can see, this is a pre-recorded version of a show. Um, and this is some of the things that you're seeing in now, uh, now more and more is people pre uh, to showing a pre-recorded version of their thing. And this gets us back to the point we started at with in the beginning. How do we, how do we, um, how do we, uh, 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 you know, how can we tell what's better, what's not? I think we have to remember getting our stuff to our people is the most important thing. So whether it's a live performance of a new musical based on a movie that has figure puppets and um, naughty lyrics and, and live music and all of that kind of wonderful stuff, great. Or if it's a performance that you're really proud of, still get it to your people and host a watch party. Um, bring people together in a Zoom meeting and kind of watch it together. Be able to use the chat, all of that kind of wonderful stuff. That's, that's again, we're trying to recreate that feeling of being in the same room with each other. And everyone agrees it's not, it's not better. It's just different. And that's kind of what we have to embrace here, like philosophically. Um, so if you have an old recording, throw it out there. If you have um, something you want to do live, throw it out there too. If you just want to host a Q&A or an Ask Me Anything session like you see on Reddit all the time, um, do those too. Uh, they're really simple to do generally um, on services like Facebook. You can just hit the live button and then do a talk back. Um, I see a uh, someone mentioned Emily Taradash. Padlet is also a great resource to gather links of performances. Absolutely. Um, Micah, you had a question. I think when people are logging into Zoom as audience members, are they viewing a pinned video? It seems like the archive on YouTube has gallery view with all the audience. How are you thinking about privacy issues in the archiving of the work? E.g. having people in their homes who may not have consented to being recorded. Great question. Okay, so I have gallery view pulled up on my computer and based on what's on my, because I was the streaming person, I was, the, I was the person hosting the meeting because I had gallery view. That's what we sent out. If I had hosted it in say presenter view, it would switch between people, but we had made a decision early on that that was distracting and we wanted to see different people in be able to kind of 
gauge their reactions in the scene. In a lot of the way you would look back and forth at people in the scene and see how they were reacting with each other, we wanted to be able to do that between squares. So that's why we chose gallery view. And as far as permission goes, we do address that right at the beginning of anything that we're doing. Um, we want to make sure that people understand that it's being live streamed and understand that it's being recorded and consent to that. Um, a lot of times you see this on radio broadcasts. It could be just as simple as asking, are you okay with us playing this on the radio? Are you okay using this for our streaming platform and just getting that verbal permission from someone? Um, if you want to, there are legal documents. A lot of them can be found online that are just boilerplate permission documents. Um, and if you want to protect yourself, that's a great way to do it. This also brings up the idea of getting permission to live stream things. Um, so for instance, Miss You Like Hell, because we had permission early on from the playwrights um, and their agents. They were wonderful about this. Um, we were able to uh, at least attempt to, to do it, even though kind of the, the restrictions on gathering in public got harsher and harsher and kind of every time we thought we had a solution, it kind of chopped us off at the legs. Um, to what we were able to do, we went and sought their permission first. That's really, really important. And you can get shut down um, if, a, if, a, if a, a playwright or an agent or a publishing company hears about this. We were talking a little bit about this um, before our meeting started on YouTube's algorithm um, being really, really sensitive to say profanity, for instance. Um, and so, um, so yeah, that's, that's, that's kind of the end of my spiel right now. Um, I figure um, if everyone wants to kind of, um, as, as they have a question, we could either do the raise hand feature um, or feel free to unmute yourself. Um, I don't, I know um, Sarah just asked a question um, about favorite resources and step-by-steps. I'll find a couple things and I'll send them to Todd and maybe we can do like a follow-up email with a, a couple links that I've found useful um, in my research, if that sounds good to everyone. Um, so yeah, that's, that's kind of my spiel. I hope I didn't bore you too much um, and you maybe found this useful. Um, yeah, and why don't we open it up to questions or conversation or just what you're doing. I'd love to hear about like what everyone else is streaming um, we heard about Bring Your Own Improv. I'd love to hear what everyone else is thinking about doing, too. Ricardo has a question. Oh, so Ricardo, you're still muted. I can unmute Ricardo. All right, I just unmuted. Can you hear me now? Beautiful, sir. All right, hello, everybody. Uh, at Mix Magic, we, we had uh, a lot of content that we owned all the rights to. And, and things like that. Um, we're an organization that depends on our, for instance, our choir, our ensemble work. It, it, it depends on a lot of people, a lot of musicians, a lot of the times. Mm -hmm. uh, so a live stream is more difficult for us because we have to assume that everybody has the same level of technology and skill in order to, to produce a live stream event remotely. So we're having to create content and then broadcast it. The question becomes, and this may be a question for you, Todd, is there a, a mechanism available in which we can let the public know, hey, Mix Magic is going to be doing an event on Tuesday at 2 o'clock and 7 o'clock. Willberry is doing something at this time. So that, uh, you know, Trinity is doing something this time. So that because I find live streams accidentally most of the time, I, you know, I, you know, I'm, I'm just going to scrolling through my computer or my, 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 uh, my phone and say, Oh, somebody's live streaming something. I had no idea it was coming. I didn't know how to prepare for it. Uh, so is there, I think we're going to be in this for a little while. Uh, it seems to me that we need to be able to help our audience understand when we're going to be, presenting and what platforms they can use and, and, and so on. Uh, Cause otherwise we're depending on everybody being tech savvy and that's just not true. And I'll, I'll mute myself to hear your answer. So the question's about kind of like a shared calendar for knowing what uh, everyone's doing. Is that, that, that the question? Yeah, yeah, a shared calendar or, or some type of uniform mechanism by which people aren't scrambling to go through five or seven different platforms to be able to find what what they need to, to do 
to to access every different organization? Is there a common link or something like that? No. And, you know, it's interesting because this is, as you all know, at risk anyway, there's, there's no marketing and communications director. It's uh, shared between three of us. And this is something that came up on conversation even this morning um, is, it is that level of amplification and how we can facilitate that. Um, we are in a moment right now where we're trying to collect what people are doing virtually with the hope of amplifying it via our own channels and perhaps uh, in partnership with the governor right now, considering the, the way in which people are using arts and culture activity online and virtually to um, do a, a negotiate this time. Um, but, but right now we're struggling with capacity and our ability to do that. And I know Ricardo also mentioned something um, that's really, really important. Um, when you have a chorus or a whole group of musicians, um, what I would say to do again, don't try and break the, don't try to break the rules as far as what is, uh, as far as how you get by all that latency and the delay and which which audio feed is prioritized mixed magic is doing it the right way you have different people um bringing together different recordings and then someone is making like a master mix of it um i, I think a lot of people have seen these on on youtube or on um on our facebook or instagram feeds about like broadway stars singing a song together and it looks it kind of imitates what's happening right now in our Zoom page. But let me assure you, that's edited together. That's not live. That's, that's mm -hmm. someone has done the editing for it. And so if you do it right, if you kind of are able to incorporate it in a way that imitates Zoom, do that. Because um, for the most part, the audience isn't going to be able to tell. And frankly, they're just happy to hear your stuff. They just want to know that you're still there and you're still like, working hard um and you're still like communicating with each other um again it's it's that philosophy where it's not going to be the same but just talk to your people get your stuff out there uh, meg and emily both had questions but meg's question was anyone an expert in facebook live streaming i'm curious about cross posting between pages versus sharing a live stream thinking about what is the best way to generate the largest reach right so i think with with Facebook in particular, you're going to have that one page that hosts the live stream. That's, again, that's probably the, the, the simplest thing. And then have as many people share that as possible. So you can share that live. And we do this all the time. Um, we stream on Facebook. Again, we don't, again, and it's simulcast. So we're actually not streaming from Facebook. It's something coming into Facebook. And then what we do is have our people share it. And again, essentially retweet it back out um and say hey check out this live stream and if i share it on my personal page people can still click the video and watch it and even though they got to it via my page so you have the one page that hosts it and then just have a team of people once that live stream starts ready to hit share um essentially you're you're creating a little digital army on your behalf um and the okay so um there's a question about um, boarding schools in China. Great question. Um, so uh, just a little bit, I just posted how you spell it in the chat, um, but there's, an, uh, there's, a, there's a, 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 a platform called Yuku in China that's owned by Alibaba. Alibaba, I don't know if anyone's ever bought something online through Alibaba before, but um, they're kind of like an Amazon counterpart. They're huge, they're government owned which gets to the problem. If you're streaming something in China, you're immediately gonna hit the, the government firewall. Nothing's allowed to their citizens without going through the government first. So if you say anything that might set off that firewall, you're not getting through. Um, there may be services over there if they have um, say an American based cell phone service um, or cell phone provider, that may be a way to get around it. But for the most part, um, small nonprofits and schools in Rhode Island, um, in the United States, are probably not going to get in to China if you're not really, really careful. Um, I can't, 
talk specifically as to like which platforms are to use. I am not a government securities or internet expert, um, but I would definitely, <laughs> shocking, I know. Yeah. Uh, but I would recommend um, doing a little research um, on on your own. Um, I'll I'm writing I'm writing it down too, and I'll see if there's anything in my um, maybe work some Google foo and try to figure out something um, a workaround maybe. Emily, did you have another question too? Yeah, I have a I have a couple of like, questions and comments about what's been uh, said so far. So like I have a website that tells me what websites. Uh, get through in China and a mm -hmm. lot of the students that I have do have VPNs, so that's not terrible but um, just for best practices and accessibility which is what Ricardo was talking about but sort of at the other end of things where you know accessibility is a huge issue right now and we're seeing that a lot in schools and that's why you know the public schools are not really even uh, grading at this point because not everybody has access to the same technology so it's not fair um, so, you know, I think that this is a big issue that is going to continue to be tackled and, and seen through. And I think like the, the bottom line is just to get content out as much as possible and, it, and in as many different platforms as possible, even though we want to streamline it, it's just like not necessarily the best way of doing it right now, because it's more about like putting a lot of stuff up on the wall as opposed to and maybe something sticks and something reaches someone um and then we'll see what works you know because this is a living process you know which is terrifying and exciting at the same time we can look at it that way where we're going to figure it out we're going to make mistakes it's not going to be perfect um but it's not about being perfect it's not about you know we want to be polished but that's like out the window right now so I think, you know, just trying to do the best that you can and give people options and then fixing it as you go along is really the way forward. You know, like we're going to make some mistakes. There's going to be some stuff with, with um, you know, people not knowing about rights and other things like that. Um, but then you just fix it, you know, then you say, I'm sorry, we'll do it differently, you know. Um, so I think everybody's just trying to do their best and i think that's what we have to keep in mind absolutely um that was awesome emily i want to touch on three things you did um and right up front i'm sorry i didn't do this we are automatically right now talking about something that is based in equity right a lot of us have access to the internet and we're very privileged to have that we all we have to address right up front that we're very very lucky um, a lot of my students at URI don't have access to computers. They don't have access to, to streamable internet. I know a lot of the things at the Manhattan Avenue project and the Trinity Academy for the Performing Arts, they're struggling with this too. We have, this is an equity issue right up front. Um, it's not fair to a lot of people. Um, so thank you for bringing it up, Emily. That's hugely, hugely important in this discussion. Um, you mentioned something called a VPN for anyone who's wondering what that is. That's a virtual private network and that's a way to reroute your signal to different servers. And this is a way that people get around government servers a lot of the time in government tracking mechanisms. Um, so you can use a, vi a virtual private network to essentially mask your 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 address, your internet address at home. Um, and that's a way to work around um, firewalls and tracking and that kind of thing. Um, and then uh, I do want to touch on one other thing. Uh, we mentioned too that again access to the internet. What I would love to see people do is contact their congressional offices and start talking about um, the internet as a utility. What we're seeing right now is um, people have access to clean drinking water in this country for the most part, right? Um, telephone services, electricity, plumbing, all of that kind of wonderful stuff because they're utilities. They are inherently guaranteed to us. The internet is not yet. And yet, all of us as teachers in a week's time were expected to change everything we do and go over the internet overnight. Um, and you're seeing a lot of struggles with this around the country and around the world. The internet should be a utility that is accessible for all and regulated and not privately abused. Um, so talk to your congressional leaders about this. This is a huge thing that we're going to see come up in the next decade. 
um, as banking moves to digital, um, access to money and government services and all that, that kind of wonderful stuff. Again, to hark back to equity, right? If how we access each other right now is regulated by some private company and not overseen by some type of government institution, um, that's a problem. And that could be a huge issue in the years to come. So contact your, reg your legislators too about that. And that is something that actually came up in our Arts Advocacy Day meetings. On yeah. Virtual. Yeah. Um, Lorenz Spears from Tomaquag Museum brought that up in the meeting we had with Senator Reed. Awesome. I know we have a 1 p.m. end time. Um, Max, I don't know if you had more time, if we wanted to extend this by 10 minutes, if there was an interest. Yeah, absolutely. I'd be happy to. So um, if anyone needs to leave, by all means, please do. Thanks for coming. Again, there's calls happening tomorrow at noon and some next week. Um, I'll send a follow-up email. Suzanne and Tom, I don't have your email addresses, so if you want to email them to me, I'll be sure to send a follow-up to you. Having said that, drop out if you need to, but we'll just keep on continuing if people have questions for at least the next 10 minutes. And we'll just kind of let things fall away if they need to fall away as well. And thank you all for coming. I really, really appreciate it. Thank you so much for being here and all the work that everyone's doing around the state. You all rock. Thank you, Max. All right, any other questions? It looks like people are bouncing. So maybe we'll just end now. Thank you all. Thank you, Max. Was so generous with your time. Oh, actually, Meg has a question. Oh shoot. Yeah. I'm sorry to keep That's us here for not at all in, in our online platform longer than we want to be. So I'm thinking <laughs> ahead um, about a, potentially a time where we might be able to gather small groups of people together, like enough to have the performers, like of a concert or a play. Um, yes, but maybe I saw. Not. I saw this in the chat. Sorry. Go. Yeah. Sorry. Please. Please continue. Uh, but maybe not to have like an audience of several hundred people. And I'm wondering if there's anything we can do now to prepare to have the right tech or to be able to do that type of streaming. Sure. So um, we talked a little bit about this. Um, I didn't touch on it just because we're, um, we were dealing a lot with like streaming tech and not necessarily um, like the mixing of it. But I did touch on this a little bit with um, talking about Christopher Johnson's performance um, at the theater. So one of the issues with big groups of performers is obviously the sound of it, right? When you have like a handful of people, um, you can mic them up and you can mix it so the balance is really great. But when you have like 20, when you start getting into like dozens of people, um, you need to be careful about miking and you need to be careful about sound, making sure that there's not a lot of echo and there's not a lot of crazy stuff going on um, in the background. So um, mixing audio becomes really, really important. If you have someone like that at your disposal on staff um, or someone you could hire, um, definitely look into that. Um, mixing boards are really great. Um, there's devices, um, there's devices, uh, I have one, it's called a Firewire box. And essentially what it allows me to do is um, I have, we have a mixing board at the theater that we bring our microphones into, we mix it there. Then the output, instead of going to speakers, it then goes into the computer. It goes into that box, which then translates the information digitally, which we then mix with that software that I mentioned before, OBS. So we take the sound from the mic, mix it, the output goes to this box, which then translates it into something that the computer can read. And then we mix it with the video feed, which is coming through a different port in the computer, um, usually like a, a Firewire port or a mini display or, or Thunderbolt port, for instance. Um, and what we did for Christopher's was a GoPro um, and the GoPro went into a um, separate little box um, that translated it into something that the computer could read. Um, let me double check. I want to make sure that I have, I'm going to give you the right name of that item. Um, sorry, this is boring watching me scroll through my applications. Um, okay, it was called um, a Black Magic device, a Black Magic Media Express device. And it was essentially a little box that took the video feed and brought and kind of mixed it so it could be live streamed. Um, there is a little bit of software that we had to mess around with on my computer, um, but that's how we took it from the live feed into something that we could stream out. And we took the mixed, balanced audio, 
synced it up with the video and then sent it out to people. That would probably be how you do something like a choral concert or a play in the months to come um, as the restrictions on on person to person interaction get lifted. Um, that kind of stuff. If that does that sort of answer your question? Yes, no, it does. I have, cool. uh, we ran a, a big concert series. So I have like the audio sound people. It was more the visual side that I yeah. was thinking of because we never have to do that piece. So I'll look into the the devices that you mentioned. Thank you sure. so much. Yeah, of course. What we did um, too, what we had planned around with, what we had planned on doing with Miss You Like Hell was taking that GoPro and essentially being like right up in the actor's faces, sort of like um, if you think uh, Les, the Les Mis movie or... Mm -hmm. um, what was another, there was another one that we referenced too, but that kind of feel, like in your face, sort of dirty um, mm -hmm. documentary film. Oh, Birdman was the other one um, that we had thought of. So a, a la that. Um, and we think people would have enjoyed that. We might pursue that even after this whole pandemic thing is done. Um, we might pursue that as a way to kind of record our stuff just in case we get into a situation like this, that the recording it isn't um, bland. It's, it's sort of, um, exciting and new and and kind of different than the other stuff you could and it feels more like you're in person mm -hmm. thank you so much sure anybody else move your head like this oh uh, daniel has a question yeah nice hand um, so a uh, quick question following up on ricardo's point yeah. um I think what he's looking for is kind of like an events listing of upcoming things going on and something that um, the local groups could post at and um, put on. And I think maybe something low tech as much as just a page that every day they delete the events that have already passed that you just kind of drop them in. I don't know if that's within your bandwidth because um, I don't know all the things you were trying to accomplish at this time. Um, but Ricardo, is that pretty much what you were thinking about? Is that kind of Todd, what, what we were thinking or? Uh, can you hear me? Yeah. You're good. Um, I guess my, my concern is, uh, as, as I said, I find things accidentally. I don't, I don't, I, I'm not able to keep up with as many things. And, and I wish there was some type of platform or calendar and also a mechanism that, uh, because a, a lot of our constituency, which has come up, uh, several people have mentioned it, is a question of access. Not everybody has high tech access, but that doesn't mean that they, those people can be, should be left out of the, out of the mix because they're already behind eight ball. They're gonna be further behind eight ball. I mean, particularly, you know, students at, at inner city high schools and, and so on like that, older people, uh, you know, we, we, it seems to me we need to find a way to allow the maximum number of people access to what we're doing with information and as simple a technology as possible to say you can go to your phone and access it there. You can go to your, if you, if you got an older computer, you can still access things because, I mean, you know, Max, you've done an incredible job here. Thank you. Uh, you we're, we're also talking about, uh, you know, I've been a theater artist for 50 years. 90% of what you were talking about, <laughs> I mean, and, 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 and that's the case for a lot of, a lot right. of people. Uh, my son, Jonathan, and my granddaughter are far ahead of me in terms of this. How do we close that gap? That's all I'm, I'm really interested in. And how do we let people know Mixed Magic Theater is doing a rebroadcast of is 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 colorways hip hop and gospel concert from a year ago, and, and it's going to be broadcast so this day at this time, and 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 we're going to be doing a serial of of a musical that it's going to take ten weeks to to get through the whole thing, and you know it's like Game of Thrones. We're going to give you. I'm, I, 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 it is like I mean I, I, I think we, I, love that. <laughs> I think we just have to start thinking like Game of Thrones and saying we can't do it all at one time, but maybe we can get people involved with the idea being 
ultimately you want to see the whole thing on stage sitting in an audience you know hamilton i saw scenes from hamilton at the white house a year before it opened yeah got me invested i i knew my shot before i knew what hamilton was about so so uh, I, I, I'll mute myself and hear any comments. Sure. Great, 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 great points. Yeah, I think it's, I think it's definitely a couple things popped into my head um, as far as like ideas and stuff like that. And Todd and I can chat um, sure. about that later. But like, yeah, simple calendar pages and and Tumblr posts and and things that people are like a. Uh, an Instagram page that's dedicated to like everything um, that might be something we should look into. Mm -hmm. Yeah. And Ricardo, the, with the latter half of what you said, you know, I'll be sharing this recording with Randy for certain and just kind of bring that into the conversation. But what I can say, Daniel, is that it, it is unfortunately a capacity issue and the conversation that to get more specific that I had this morning um, with my fellow staff members was that I, I feel what we do at RISCA is limited because um, there's no there's no marketing communications person. Other state arts agencies do have someone that's uh, that's their purpose. Um, and I felt like I've been dropping the ball on what I manage because of what's happening right now, right? And our primary uh, responsibility is to our constituents and their needs in this moment. What we do anyway is limited because we tend to communicate on platforms with people that we know. So we have Facebook, we have our state website, which is what it is. But the next level of what you're talking about is something where it's about external communication other than to our primary people, right? Like you all. Um, and it's something that we're having an active conversation about, about how to address, you know, obviously in this moment, getting a marketing communications person isn't likely, but is it possible that we could partner with um, someone external to us as a state agency that could that could do that, et cetera, to help us with that communication. So we're trying to figure that out right now. But I'm also um, happy to talk with Max and other people about solutions that they might be able to think of that would not necessarily uh, take more risk of staff time, since that's obviously at a premium in this moment, but could maximize other things that are out there, you know, or other networks or other, other uh, entities. Um, thank you for that. I. Uh... I would say, Ricardo, on the point of accessibility, it's one of the reasons BYOI chose to broadcast to YouTube because Zoom gave us the option. I'm very interested, Max, to learn more about the Vimeo um, simulcast. I look like a plan could be up to $75 a month, so I wanted to see you know, which plan you might be using sure. to do that, but we chose YouTube because um, you know, uh, students, everybody can get that on their phone, much along you know, the TikTok or Instagram. It's a common app where not as many people are using Facebook. You, well, it's, you gotta be a member to be part of that, where YouTube, you don't need to be a member of anything. You just pull up on your phone and you're there. Um, but Max, what, um, what kind of plan do you need to be able to simulcast to both of those services? Um, I'm just looking at cost, we're an improv show, not a major theater. So like sure. our average tickets are like five to $7 and we're doing our shows for free right now because we know that families are really suffering. Right. We do do some donations, which is fine, but we just wanted to, A, we wanted to perform because you know, we, otherwise you're gonna go dry, but B, it was like, hey, 30% or 20% unemployment, we want to, so our shows are free to our audiences. Right. Um, and especially since we got kids involved, you know, volunteering. Um, yeah, any any way to keep this as cheap as possible would be helpful because this is only fifteen dollars a month. I was like, Psh, drop in a bucket, but seventy five dollars right. a month. It's like hey, you're actually reaching my cost limit. Yeah, yeah. It it was. Um, I think the, I think the the plan that we have is a premium plan. It is exactly that. Um, specifically because we knew how much we were going to do um we knew how much streaming we were going to do with it that we could we could associate the cost um i think one of the things to look into now um and todd may be able to kind of comment to this a little bit better but um as far as what um what kind of grants are out there for programs um and and what you could essentially associate as like a disaster cost in order to like shift your business online um I don't know if Vimeo is something you could actually get paid for 
um, with like a small business grant or something that um, that Riska is promoting right now. Um, uh, Todd and Molly might be able to comment on that a little bit better. Um, but this might be something that you could offset, um, essentially from from a from an accounting perspective, I guess. No, that's interesting, and and what you're making me think of too with that comment, Max. We, you know, like we kind of mentioned at the start of the call, you know, things are changing for everyone every few hours. And one of the things that we don't know yet is what strings will attach to NEA money that we receive. Right. It could be limited to just organizations. It could be limited to just general operating support. But, you know, to the degree which we have access to funds that have some flexibility to them, it could be to support moves like that, or it could be a shifting in our project grants depending so yeah. that, that you're making me think that when that happens it might be worthwhile to have conversations of some sort between molly and i and others with with people like you all to be like hey like we have flexibility with this money how how best to do that and again we might not but and I, and i'll bring that to molly in terms of sba or other things if, if they might be available for that. ricardo had a question A comment. Uh, at some point, you know, if we're not careful, we could all become very savvy filmmakers and, and streaming content makers. And if there's not a unified message or something that says the object of everything we're doing is to get you back in a seat for a living experience, because, you know, things go away when they go away for a period of time. Right. Yeah. And, and we've got to be very clear to our public and to ourselves. We are not trying to create streaming material. We're trying to get people get stay in contact with people so they, they will come back and sit in a seat and experience the live art, the living art. And, and if, if we lose sight of that, it, it'll be a double burden for us to get back to it when we do get a chance to get back to it. Hundred percent, hundred percent, and I think one of the wonderful things you're seeing too is, um, and I know this is Wilbury's audience base. What we're seeing is like a lot of "we miss you," um, great job g continuing to fight to be there, um, and all of that kind of stuff. I, I, what I hope to see, and this, this will sort of play out as the year continues, is hopefully we'll see in-person subscriptions start to increase because people miss that, and next year as everyone's season starts up again, assuming we're out, we're in the clear, again, fingers crossed, right? Um, we'll see a huge increase and we can use this opportunity to launch something in person um, and be like, hey, remember this time when we couldn't be in person for like half of a year? Spend a year with us then. And here's your subscription cost and remember what you're missing. Um, at the same time, I think this also provides opportunities for us to grow as an as a as an industry and to and, and in general it's like what we do as an industry is we face challenges creatively and with obstacles and with with challenges comes creativity and innovation and I think that's what we're seeing right now is that the creative community is fighting this better than some of our standard industries are um, I know the theater department at URI is kind of killing it in the online teaching game. Um, and so it, whereas like some of the other like classic and like STEM departments are not. And so what you're seeing is creatives come out of the woodwork and really a focus on the art um, and the art. And I mentioned this the other day in the congressional meeting, it's art and theater and music and, and, and all of those industries are economic catalysts normally where you have theaters pop up other businesses pop up when when you have a show other people do other things in the neighborhood they buy drinks they buy stuff um and what we're seeing now is the art instead of being a business catalyst is kind of like a um it's kind of like a medicine it's it's art is bringing us all and kind of in in keeping us sane right now it's 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 bringing us together in ways um that isn't um it, it even though it's not getting us out of the house and getting us together it's 
acting as like a societal me uh, uh, Advil. It's like getting rid of the pain that we were, we're all feeling right now. And, and if, if we can use this online platform to bring people together and feel better, then more power to you. That's exactly what we need to do. Um, I'm gonna have to cut us short, unfortunately, or not short, because I have another meeting at 1.30. Um, but Gray had one last comment that I thought was great that she, or they messaged. Strikes me that to market yourselves in the future, your streaming might include specific information about your location because I think people are discovering institutions online that they previously did not frequent. Totally. Thank you for bringing that up, Gray. And that so, kind of speaks to Ricardo's point, like yeah. some type of place there where a discovery of what's going on and who people are. Totally, and it's it's great to have that in mind right now, particularly when we're in Ricardo, because you're about right, it could become the new normal in a way that might not be helpful. Yeah. Um, Max, thank you again. For, for doing this, much appreciated. Thank, Thank you. you all for being here. Yeah, for, for hanging in there. Um, I do have to run, Max, so I'll check in with you later. I'll email you or something. Sounds good, sir. Hi, everyone. Take care, y'all. Thanks for coming. Thank you.